All right. Hello, 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 everybody. I want to thank you for joining us again for another great Money Monday. As you know, each Monday, we bring you actionable tools in order to put together your wealth guide as you go along your financial independence journey, whatever that might look like. And today we have a speaker because regardless of what your wealth guide looks like, you need this. Um, so you might not want to be in real estate investing or you might not want to do X, Y, and Z. But at the end of the day, we're all going to die. <laughs> Some of us are going to have a different path before we make our final day. And everyone that is listening to this and everyone who missed out on it, they need an estate plan. So you're listening today so you can provide the message to somebody else. And so I am Rosalind Brown. I'm always here and available and excited about this journey. And I have Greg Davis with me. Greg is a native New Yorker. He's a graduate of the Norman Adrian Wiggins School of Law at Campbell University. In addition to being a licensed attorney in North Carolina, he also holds an MBA from Bowie State University and received his undergraduate degree in economics from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. While at UPenn, Greg was captain of the men's track and field team, focusing on running in sprint and relay races. Greg's focus is serving his clients in the areas of wills and estate planning, real property law, commercial and residential contracts, corporate services, and on and on and on. Greg is a former trust officer with a large regional bank and worked as a financial advisor with a Wall Street firm, as well as a data warehousing consultant. He has also taught the foundations of financial and portfolio management as an adjunct professor at the Meredith College. Greg has also published ABCs of Money for Girls and Boys. So for your kids too, we might have to have him come do a little session for the kids and believes young children should review the basics of money early and often. So many of us probably would be in a much better situation had we started earlier and maybe got some more education often. Greg enjoys spending time with his wife and their four children, outdoor activities, soccer, trail, biking, and building furniture. All right, we might have to get you to build a sofa or something for us too. <laughs> so without further ado, I want to say thank you so much, Greg, for being here with, with us today and sharing these gems. And I'm going to turn the floor over to you. All right, Greg has a great presentation for us, a good little PowerPoint. Yeah. All right, we're ready to go. All right, uh, it's going in and out, but um, I'm just gonna keep going as if you guys can hear me just fine. So Rosalind, thank you so much for having me uh, present to the group. Uh, I think this is a very, very timely topic. So after the presentation, if anybody wants to contact me directly, my phone number is 919-794-5935, and my email is greg at trustylawyers.pro. So let's get right into it. Estate planning essentials. So what? So as a brief outline of what we're going to talk about over these next 15 minutes or so, we're going to talk about beneficiary designations. What exactly is probate? Uh, what is a will? Uh, what is a trust? And then what are those essential documents that in my, in my opinion, everybody, everybody needs. All right, beneficiary designations. So certain things can pass outside of a will. And those things are retirement accounts like your 401k plan, uh, your individual retirement account, uh, if you have a pension or even your insurance policies. And how it works is the beneficiary designation needs to be completed, but not only completed, it also needs to be updated with any major life changes. So for example, a change in your marriage situation, uh, if there's a new child, if there's a new job, uh, the last thing you want is to have a new spouse and you pass away, but the old spouse's name is down on that beneficiary designation form. So make sure with any major life change that you update those beneficiary designation forms, right? That's a great way and an easy way to pass those major assets on to the correct people, okay? Now, uh, when you die with the will, 
That's called dying testate. If you die without a will, then that's known as being intestate. But what's the difference? Well, the difference is that uh, your estate has to go through what's known as probate. And when it goes through probate, if there's no will, then the state determines where your assets go. And I don't know how you feel, but I know I definitely want to control where my assets are going. Okay, when I think about the word will, I, I break it down to a couple letters. The, the will and W stands for me, um, my wishes, my wishes. The I stands for individuals. So I have wishes, and I have individuals that want to benefit from those wishes. And who are those individuals? That's the L. Those are individuals that I, that I love. And when I'm planning my will, I'm also thinking about leaving my legacy. So my will stands for my wishes to benefit individuals that I love. And I'm thinking about uh, how am I going to create my legacy? Okay, that's, that's what a, real, a will really is to me. So what is that probate process exactly? Well, during probate, uh, they determine the validity of a will. They inventory your assets. Uh, they pay down creditors. Uh, you make distributions to uh, people who are in the will. And you make publications in the newspaper to make sure that all creditors have been alerted that this is their time to come after any assets that they're owed. Okay, That process can typically, typically take up to take quite a bit of time. But it's a much orderly, more orderly process if you have a will in place. All right. A will. Now, Greg, you said with any life change, but what if you've been working at the same job for 20 years, you didn't get married, you haven't had any kids? Is the will still good since nothing material has changed? Well, yes. The will is still good. Um, some people say, well, Greg, you know, I don't, I don't really have any assets. I don't need a will. Well, if you own any property or if you have uh, a generous amount of assets, or if you have uh, small children, you definitely want to have that will. Because although the beneficiary designation forms can dictate where your, let's say, 401k assets go, it doesn't spell out, well, these are the people that I want to be the guardian of my children. So the will goes a step beyond what you're naming as your beneficiaries for those retirement accounts. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's big. I know a lot of people are like, well... Do I need it? Do I need to make any changes? Do I need to dust this thing on off or even see if the <laughs> see if the dog ate it? Any of those kind of things. <laughs> right. Now, you know, something else to also get is, you know, people are moving, right? People are people, employers are saying, you know what? Why don't you keep that that California salary and you can move to another state and still do your work remotely? So if you already have your documents, some people are saying, well, if I change states, do I need to update my will? Well, that's a very good question. Now, a well-drafted will does not need to be updated just because you move from one state to another. However, it's important to work with an attorney or do your own research to figure out if any laws in those states are different. So if the laws are different, then the way the will be treated could be different. So it does make sense to at least review the will to see if there are any major changes or differences in law between your old state and your new state. Oh, I think that's big in this virtual world. So if you pick up and you're deciding to go to some other state and decide to take a break, and then what would be considered a break? So for the people, especially in this virtual world, so someone's working in a high cost of living place, maybe they're working in New York, and they decide, oh, I'll go down to Florida or the Carolinas or whatever that might be. Right. How long are they there? If they haven't necessarily, if they just get like a month long, two month long Airbnb or something like that, and they pass away in that state, does that matter? Or is it maybe a grayer area or is it something not to necessarily be concerned about? Yeah. If, if they haven't taken up residence in that new state, meaning uh, they don't have a driver's license, Since there, they don't be still going to be considered a resident of the previous state. So that's not really uh, a major issue. The, a major issue would be uh, something like how are executors treated? So, for example, let's just say in New York, you are allowed to have an executor in your state um, 
But let's say you move to North Carolina, and North Carolina says, well, you have to have a uh, resident agent that is present in North Carolina, and you, you move to New York. So in some states, they say, well, if, if you're here and you're out of state, you can still be the executor. But some states say, well, if you're here, but you moved away, you can't be the resident agent. You have to actually hire an attorney or have someone in state to perform that service for you. So it's these little distinctions that can differ between one state to another. That's big stuff to know is everybody keeps moving, picking up and moving, accepting that job offer. <laughs> when you accept the job offer, find you a local attorney. <laughs> this environment also where people are still debating about traveling period. Some people don't want to get on the plane. People are still debating about whether or not to get the vaccine shot. Then you have to think about, well, who are the executives that are listed on my will? Who are the guardians? And if I live in North Carolina, but I list them and they're in New York, but they're not comfortable leaving New York, it might be time once again to consider changing that will. If your exec executors are not willing to travel because they're a little afraid about what's happening with the, the, the COVID situation. So just, these are all things to think about, which is, you know, makes it a, good, a great time to think about updating that will. So true. Okay. So let's go ahead and move forward. We talked about the importance of naming guardians for your children, which you can do in your will. And you might also hear a conversation about a living trust, okay? And a living trust is like one level beyond having a will. So if, if this thing is a, is, a, is a pyramid, at the bottom we have making sure our beneficiary designations are situated. The next level up is make sure that we have a will in place. And the next level up is having a living trust. Please keep in mind, not every trust pr provides you privacy. When you pass and you have a will, that will become Thumbs public record. If privacy is important to you, then you want to put your assets inside of a living trust. Now, do keep in mind, do keep in mind that with a living trust, there's definitely a higher cost involved. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's talk a little bit about cost. On average, for a will, for individual, you could look to spend somewhere between seven and nine hundred dollars, depending upon the complexity of that will. For a couple, it could be anywhere between between $900 and $1,100. Once again, depending upon the complexity of the will and all attorneys that you might work with charge different rates, okay? For a living trust, that could start maybe right around $1,500 and that can go as high as, as high as the moon, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, it all depends. Because inside that living trust, you can do things that are a little more sophisticated like tax planning. So for example, if you have an estate that is gonna be subject to estate taxes, which means that you have assets of more than $11.7 million, which most people don't have, but if you do have those size assets, you can use some estate tax planning strategies inside of a living trust to minimize, okay, to minimize the amount of tax that you have to pay, all right? So let's take it from the bottom. Get the beneficiary designation information situated first, second, have a will. Make sure that you're taking care of those loved ones. You're naming the guardians for your children. And third, if you are concerned about avoiding probate, you're interested in privacy, and you want to have some maybe estate tax planning because you're getting close to that tax bracket where you might have some estate tax issues, consider a living trust. Now, having those limits changed over the years, how often should we expect or at least you know, things can change. And if you're not on that list of people who are always reading these articles or staying in the loop, that can go down as far as what, 2 million, 3 million. And that all of us are going to have. Um, so we might not hit the $11 million mark, but how often or what's a trigger to see has that number changed? So you might be at $2 million today and say, oh, I'm safe. But 
then the 11 million changes to two or 3 million, I, then you say, oh, wait, I, I probably need to do something to protect some of my wealth. Rosalind, you, you're exactly right. Um, I, mean, I, I worked with a client the other day and I was asking her, I said, well, you know, if, if you guys have about 11.7 million, then you guys are going to have some estate tax issues. And she starts laughing. I mean, she's laughing like a very heavy and hearty laugh. She's like, we, we have nowhere near that amount. But just like you said, those limits can change. And so limits are typically in place for uh, three. I believe the next time that the estate limit is set to change, I believe it's about three or four years from now. So two things can happen for an individual. I have another client that has assets that are close to about uh, three, $4 million. Two things can happen. One, they win the lottery. Okay, let's say they don't play the lottery. Let's say they win a major lawsuit and then they go from having three or four million to five or six million. And if that tax level comes down from 11 to four, now they have an estate tax issue. Okay, so oftentimes with the living trust, you set up a plan so that the what if is covered. If the estate tax limit comes down, you're covered. If your assets should blossom later in life, you're covered. So those things can change. So it's important to work with a professional to make sure that your plan stays up to date. With the, trust, the more your money grows, you're going to need a few more attorneys. So that's always <laughs> key. Exactly, exactly. There's estate management, probate avoidance, family maintenance, and there's tax planning in a living trust. Let's move forward. All right. So here we have the essential documents, all right? We already talked about a will. That's like at the bottom of the pyramid, right? When I work with clients, um, nobody just gets a will. We put together a will package because it does, make, it does make sense to have just one without having these other three legs of the stool. The second leg of that stool is your healthcare power of attorney. And that document is saying, I nominate this person to be my, my healthcare agent to make decisions for me if I'm unable to make those decisions for myself. In a situation where somebody is married, typically that healthcare agent is gonna be their spouse. If they're not married, then it's typically a very close and trusted family member, like a parent or a very, very good friend, right? That's to help you make, make decisions on your behalf should you become incapacitated. Now, those are healthcare decisions, but not, not life or death decisions. Those life or death decisions are covered by the health Healthcare directive, also known as the living will. Okay, so if you're in your, your mid 40s like me, you might remember a case by a woman named Terry Shivo, and she was incapacitated, and the family wanted to keep her alive, and the husband didn't want her to stay on the machines anymore. So the healthcare directive is where you're basically saying, I want to die a natural death, or I want my doctor to perform heroic measures to keep me alive. That's the health. Healthcare directive. Healthcare power of attorney, that's just medical decisions. Healthcare directive, that is a life or death situation. Don't want a natural death or not. And lastly, in my opinion, one of the most important is the financial power of attorney. And that's when, once again, you're naming a health, excuse me, a financial agent to make the decisions on your behalf related to anything related to your finances, whether that be your bank accounts or your real estate or your assets. And you actually get to choose what things you want to grant that person the power to do. Once again, if they're married, the agent is typically going to be their spouse. If you're not married, that's typically going to be a parent or a close relative or a very close and trusted friend. So this is the power for the will, the healthcare power of attorney, the living will, and the financial power of attorney. Okay. And if you notice this picture in the background, this message in a bottle, all these documents don't mean a thing if nobody knows where they're being kept. So it's very, very important that those people that you've named as your healthcare agent, as your financial power of attorney, know where these documents are kept. Where are the copies kept? Do you have a backup stored electronically somewhere in the cloud? And if you have given them that, 
then make sure you give them the USB and password to access that information in the cloud also, because it's very, 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 very hard to, to get access to someone's digital accounts without having a prior grant of that authority. So along with your important documents, in my opinion, put a list together, put the usernames and put the passwords down and try to keep those updated to make sure that those important people have access to those important documents. Now, in terms of like the healthcare power of attorney versus the directive, what are going to be some of the major things? Because maybe they can make small decisions, but what if you're, what if things take a turn for the worse? When is the actual switch off period between one versus the other? Because the power of attorney, would that be something maybe you come down with dementia or Alzheimer's or something like that? Would that be the power of attorney or would that be the actual directive? Uh, very good question. And when you're filling out your health care directive, also called the living will, you get to decide in that document which document supersedes. You can say the health care power of attorney supersedes, or you can say the health care directive supersedes. So you get to decide. And also inside of that living will, you get to be very specific. If I'm in a vegetative state for X, amount of time, I do not want to be on a machine. If I'm in a vegetative state for X amount of time and there's no hope of recovery, I still would like to receive uh, nutrition and water so that I can pass without pain. So you get to be very specific with, with how you would like to pass. And then we have a question. What is a living trust? Is that the same as a living will? Ah, very good. And so lots of names are thrown around. So let's, let's make sure we don't get them confused. And I'm so glad that you asked. A living will is a healthcare directive. And that's the document where you basically say, I would like to die a natural death. Or you say, no, prolong my life. And I, and I, I give you the authority to take these steps to do that. That's the healthcare directive. That's the living will. That's separate from a living trust. A living trust, a separate entity that you create, and let's say it's, it's my trust. I could create the Gregory S. Davis Revocable Trust, okay? And now I've created this entity. Think of it as a, as, a, as a bucket. It's an empty bucket. And now I can put assets into that bucket that I want to avoid probate. So example, I could take my house. Right now, now my house is titled in my name and my wife's name. We could take this house and put it in the name of the trust. And now the house has protection because it's inside of the trust. So the trust is an entity that's gonna hold assets that you want to avoid privacy, excuse me, that you wanna avoid probate and that you wanna have privacy and just kind of speed up the process of getting those assets to your loved ones. A living will is your healthcare directive. That's what you're saying, whether or not you wanna have a natural death. Great question. I don't know. It's something people don't necessarily want to think about, but I think uh, the privacy in and of itself, you know, we've been so private about what we have, how much we have. And the last thing you want to do is then not everybody know your business, either that you have a lot or that you didn't have as much as they thought you did. And then that actually makes it worse for the next generation. So I know we were talking about like our parents and so forth. And so what's going to happen when somebody can look up and see that your parents <laughs> just passed along X because their estate is out there in the open. You think about the number of telemarketers right. and you know, slimy people that are going to call you and say, I can help you with that. I see you just came into some money. How can I assist you with that? Those kind of things. And so it may just be nicer and more peaceful during your grieving process that everyone doesn't know what was a part of your parents' estate and so forth. So that can pass along to you peacefully and quietly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, and I'll tell you what, uh, one, one of the side benefits that I'm seeing from uh, working with clients who are putting these documents together, um, just like during this pandemic, where I know from, from my family, we were forced to stop taking the kids to soccer practice. 
uh, you know, no more book club for the choir. And building these documents, doing this together as a family, it, it's more glue. You know, you, you really get to have some frank and honest conversations uh, with yourself and, and with your loved ones about uh, what you would like their responsibilities to be, uh, should they need you, and then what responsibility they'll have when you pass. Uh, it, it, it's really a, a, a beneficial uh, time that, that, that people spend together putting these documents together. Not necessarily the best date night, but definitely something that's but you needed. Know what? I've been thinking positive <laughs> that because I, I'm trying to encourage people to make it a date, make it a date, right? When, when, that's such a man. When, when you, you when you come in to sign is. those documents, yeah. right? <laughs> I, I, know I, I know what a date is. I know what I know what a date is. I have date. I, I got a date night coming up. I know what a date is. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I'm telling you. Um, it's just like, it's just like ma getting married, right? Getting married is this big, like frustrating process until you get to the day and then you get to take that honeymoon after to celebrate. So, Hey, go, go through the process of putting your documents together, but then plan so that at the end, go out on for a night on the town. After you go out, go out for that signing, you signed all your documents, you took that responsibility, go out, celebrate. Cause you did something very, very important. And that should be celebrated make it a date night absolutely try absolutely. him on a good date um we got another good question <laughs> here's, something. here's something here's something here's something here's something all right all right i'll have a husband and wife come in and see me and it's the husband that that made the appointment the it might not be said but i know i can see it in the wife that she appreciates that he took the time out to schedule this appointment. And if, if, if you're a woman and if you're a single woman, you're already used to making decisions on your own, traveling on your own, doing what's right for you. I think about it like, um, like my, my garage or my car. I make it a point to vacuum out that front seat of that car because when I get in there, I don't want to see those crumbs. When I go to my garage, I don't want to see a mess, right? I want that thing to be free and clear and organized so that I can use my brain to think about expanding my business. In my mind, having these documents together is the same thing, right? I know I need to do it. I want to do it. I want to make time to do it, but you just don't. But when you do it, I organize that part of my life. Let me open up the rest of my brain to do everything else I need to do to be successful. That's how I think about it. Now that's key. I think that's major. So many of us are like, eh, I don't want to do it. Just go ahead and do it. Be done with it. I mean, it might not be right. date night, but maybe I'll take some shots afterwards and be like, all right, at least we check this thing on off. So I don't count that as date night, but have a little bit of fun. Um, we do have another question. It says, can your will be in the living trust? Well, can your will be in the living trust? So this is how it normally works. Um, a will will normally say, uh, should I pass, when I pass, pay my debts this way, pay my taxes this way, pass my personal assets, pass my real assets this particular way. But with the will where there's a trust behind it, uh, they, they call it a, a pour over will. So inside the will, you'll say, I would like to pass my assets as dictated in the Gregory S. Davis Rogable Trust, okay? So that will essentially points to the trust on how to handle those assets that have been put into the trust. That's a good one. So it's, the will is a tool that then almost funds the actual trust itself. Um, another question says, can you make your living trust the beneficiary on your 401k or life insurance or TSP or 403b, those kind of things? Can you make your trust the beneficiary? You know, I don't see why you could not. However, 
Uh, that's a question I would have them take to their CPA. I don't see why you could not, but I, I would definitely take that question to their their CPA or their accountant. And I've definitely seen it um, in my space. I've definitely seen them name whomever. And that is just one, <laughs> make sure that the, the naming is correct because your provider won't verify. So if you say the Rosalind Brown Trust, then it's actually the R Brown Trust, you might have an issue <laughs> and you'll have a bit of a problem in terms of establishing where those funds go. Um, so you're going to need to speak with also whoever is providing that plan itself so they can go through and say, how does it need to be titled? And you may actually need to provide those documents to make sure that the plan is titled. Your provider might not. So you might need someone just to kind of verify and make sure that it's titled correctly on the document, because I have seen some people use shorthand. Like Greg said, is it Greg Davis or is it Greg S? Davis or is it Gregory Davis and there might be somebody else that got Greg Davis trust and they like that's yeah. my yeah. <laughs> that's my money <laughs> so that's good uh, another very, question very specific. <laughs> very specific. yes um, she says do I need a lawyer to set up the living trust is this something she can do on her own or does she need to engage with an attorney Well, I'll tell you, um, there are software programs out there, of course. Um, and I, 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 I'll tell you like this. Um, in my opinion, you should work with a lawyer because that lawyer has likely seen other trusts that are similar to what you need. And if they're a good lawyer, they'll do the research to make sure that you get all the help that you need. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, when I'm asked to paint a room in this house, uh, I used to always just go to the big box retail store and I love them. You know, Lowe's Home Depot. And I never understood why somebody would go to a, a Sherwin Williams for paint. I'm like, it's paint, what difference does it make? And so last summer I had to do some painting and I, I went to Sherwin Williams just to check it out. Now they did charge more, but I'll tell you what, the level of service that I received there was well worth it. And now I, I see why professional painters, they go to Sherwin-Williams. It's because when you go to, there's a professional that knows what you're looking for. They have context, they have context, right? And that ability to, to place your needs in the context makes me feel more comfortable. If you're working with a good attorney that can give you that context, and I'll tell you straight up, not all attorneys are good. Not all attorneys are good. It's just it's just facts. So you have to make sure that the attorney that you go to can put it in a context to make you feel comfortable. In my opinion, if you want that Sherman Williams experience, work with an attorney who can put it in context for you, if that helps. I think that's a really good point um, and something to touch on too, because I'm sure a number of people, they're like, oh, a few hundred dollars for this, you know, all the essential documents. Couldn't I just get that online, print out some stuff, sign it, and now I have a will and so forth. What are going to be some of those top issues that the online software or, you know, a quick Google search <laughs> will template might miss? I, I know you touched on earlier things like state specific, because if you just Google, you know, online will template, and it may or may not say what state you're in. Um, it might not bring up some of those things, but what are some other things that people might miss if they're just using some online or free platform or you know, $50wheels.com, something like that? Yeah, so uh, most software programs are meant to be generic. And uh, if, you, if you're comfortable with something generic, I understand that. But most people have specific needs. Um, one client I was working with, she had young children, she had a business, several real estate properties in different states, and she had very specific needs on how she wanted those assets divvied up to her, her young children, who one of them was a minor, and one was not. She had residual income coming in from a franchise, she had money coming in from a business, she had these different properties. And so we get into these, these details and you're getting very specific on how you want to distribute, distribute these assets, then 
in my opinion, the software program, um, it's just not as friendly when it comes to making those distributions easy. And in addition, uh, there's something about that back and forth. There's something about just me and Rosalind being on here together and I'm talking and she's feeding me questions and we're laughing and we're building, we're building a relationship, right? We're building a relationship. And so now we start with the will, but then maybe the next time we talk, we talk about forming your LLC. Maybe the next time we talk, we talk about doing your, your power. It's established. You'll get that with just a software program it, that has its place. But if you're really thinking about, about building, right? This is my CPA. This is my team. This is my banker. Then in my opinion, you, you want to work with an attorney that can put it in context for you and, and, and help elevate you to that, that next level. That's my opinion. I think that's a good point you made. I, when I had my estate plan documents, I was like, oh, I mean, I don't have no kids. I ain't having no kids. I'm not married. Like this simple. And then as I started talking, she was like, but wait a minute, but hold on. Wait, you said what you do? Okay. Hold on. Wait, that's in a different state. Oh, wait. Okay. And it was like, no girl, like this is simple. It's just me. Like I ain't taking care of nobody. Um, and so sometimes just that conversation in and of itself will say, oh, wait, right. <laughs> your situation is more complex because you might just say, oh, I just got a house. I don't have any kids. I'm not married. And then as you keep talking, they're like, but wait, hold on. You said what? You said, you know, it might be this right. person and this person that might fight over X, Y, and Z, or, you know, right. you got two brothers and sisters, but you don't like, but one, like <laughs> those are things you want to put in a document because <laughs> it's going to be the one that you don't like that's going to be fighting the hardest talking about that was my baby sister or whatever it might be. And so like, those are the things that you want to put in writing. Um, because it could be something as simple as who makes the decisions. And um, I've shared the story so many times about my sister and her stroke and so, so forth in terms of everything that's happened over the last year or so. But if you are single, and um, I always say my mom's still my emergency contact, but my mom ain't young. She, you know, she ain't in her 40s. So um, <laughs> what happens then? And those contingents and so forth, like those are a big thing. Um, and then God forbid something happens right. and we're together. So then what happens then? Um, so that's one thing too, just about what's the difference between this online platform. I always say you can do it yourself, but if you've ever tried to do a lot, I've tried a whole bunch of home projects and I tried to paint myself too. And I was like, nah, I'm, I'm going to go and leave this half painted wall <laughs> and call somebody. So um, that's one thing too. We had another good question and I think this is good. And it kind of piggybacks on the same thing. Um, she says she heard Susie Orman has a product that help people to organize, um, these items. And she says she's going to find a lawyer. Yes, girl, find your lawyer. Um, and I, I, I personally think this is kind of right in line with like the online platforms because she's not an attorney and you know, if you're not an attorney, you're just not an attorney. Uh, any thoughts on that, Greg? Yeah. Um, you know, when I'm going to do a, a project, uh, if I'm looking for a CPA, I, I'm going to talk to, to three uh, because I, I value that person's knowledge and experience. So in my opinion, yeah, shop shop around, you know, get, get see if you get some referrals, talk to two or three, compare the prices, uh, have a, a Zoom call, go to the office and just see, you know, you know what I like to do? This is what I like to do. Uh, I like to call and I want, I want to hear who answers the phone and how they answer the phone. And if I leave a message, I want to see how long it takes for them to call me back. Because I mean, that's telling me something about whether or not they have a process in place. So if they have a process in place to do that, to get back to me, then they have a process in place to get my estate documents together efficiently. All right. So th that's how I would do it. I, I, I like to work with people. I think, uh, I think there's more benefit there. Yeah, and I do like sometimes you get those initial um, like questionnaire type documents too. So you get the questionnaire, but you have that conversation. And it was, you know, you'll see if it's thorough and you're like, my God, I ain't thought about that. Like I thought about, you know, <laughs> who, <laughs> who gets my old DVD collection or whatever. Like, <laughs> But it, it, it should make you think. Um, 
And unfortunately, they should have seen some of these, you know, what happened when they didn't. I'm quite sure some of these same attorneys are getting calls from someone that had absolutely nothing in place. And, you know, the husband that they never got a divorce from 20 years ago is coming and saying, all right, I'm gonna come pick up this house. Y'all can get out those kind of things. Like those are things that they've seen and they can say, what happens if you don't, what happens if you do the, all those kind of scenarios that they can kind of feed you so you can make a better decision too. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Absolutely right. All right. Now, um, you did talk about like the passwords and stuff. I think that's big. We talked about that a little while ago. I know you probably don't want to okay. give everybody a password. You might want to give some people a password and some people not. Um, <laughs> you might be like, my mama don't need my Twitter account. But um... <laughs> well, well, now that we're talking about that, um, inside of your will, you can cover digital assets, right? So inside your will, you're saying, I'm going to grant X, Y, Z, maybe my executor, the authority to access that. But once again, that means nothing if there's no list somewhere of those user IDs and passwords to access those accounts. Now, where should you, so you get all these documents together. Um, do you put them under your mattress or um, <laughs> keep it in the back seat of the car? Where do you keep these documents? Um, you know, the, the old school method is to keep it in a safe deposit box at the bank, which still is not a bad idea, uh, but at minimum, uh, you should have at least a folder or a binder uh, inside your home that somebody knows where that folder or binder is that has those essential documents in it. Uh, and if you wanna take it a step further, uh, then get yourself a nice uh, fireproof bag and keep the binder and folder inside that bag inside your home. Yes, yeah, somebody actually dropped the fireproof bag um, that she purchased from Amazon. And I went and got me one too. Ladies, I think it's less than $20 if I'm not mistaken. Uh, once this is over, I'm gonna find the link and I'm gonna drop the link in there. It was less than $20. It came super simple. It's small enough to fit, you know, basic documents in there. And then you can throw it somewhere that's readily available. So somebody don't have to go searching all through your house, depending on how clean you keep your house and they can quickly and easily find it. So I think that's a great idea. Um, we have another question that says, so I need to create a list of all my passwords. I would think you can do one of two ways. If you have one of those like password lockers, like a um, online, like phone, whatever, or like the iCloud that saves all the passwords. Remember, they might not have your face and you don't want them like, you know, with, with, with your phone over your dead face. Like, <laughs> let me open her phone. Um, just something to get them started. So it might be just to get into like that save password place. Now, would it make sense to separate your passwords? Like I might be like, all right, you can have my bank account, but you can't have my social media. Like, <laughs> is that something? Can I split my digital yeah, assets? Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you have to figure out what makes you feel comfortable and, and going through this process will help you figure that out, right? You can make a list and say, access to these things, but not those things, absolutely. Yeah, you might not want your mama knowing all the all the DMs that you get and all that. <laughs> <laughs> and that might be something too that's not in that blanket template. So you get a little online document and you're like, wait, I didn't want to give her all the passwords. I didn't want everything available. Um, so that's one thing too. And some of the social media sites are starting to put in where you can actually say who that person is, yeah. almost like a beneficiary designation on social media. It's crazy how far they've come. So that's something to think about too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, something else I didn't mention about um, your bank accounts. Uh, there's a designation that you can have, also your, your brokerage accounts, uh, your TD Ameritrade, E-Trade, wherever it is that you might trade your, your stocks, uh, you can have a designation called transfer on death. Uh, that way, as soon as you pass, then ownership of those accounts transfer to that person that you've named uh, as your, your transfer on death person. Uh, it's just another great way to you know, expedite the process of, of giving people um, the ability to, to, to take care of your estate uh, when you're no longer here. 
I think that's a big point, especially for some of the ladies that are like, I'm self-insured and nothing is wrong with that. But if you're self-insured and you die today, the funeral home want to get paid tomorrow. And they're going to be like, we, we ain't dressing this body <laughs> for free on an IOU. Um, and I mean, as Greg talked about, it might take some months to go through the estate planning process, but it's a lot quicker to show up at the bank and say, hey, I'm payable on death. Let me go ahead and get that checking account. And then I could go ahead and start paying some expenses. So you don't want things to kind of get into a ride as you're waiting on whatever it might be to come through so you can get money from that estate. So that's a great point to make and just to make sure that it's in place. Because if you don't have health, if you don't have life insurance, which that's your choice, um, you're going to want to make sure you have these things in place. So whoever it is, make it easy for them. Because if not, they're going to be like, well, you can have her. That's all right. Let me go on through the house, see what I can find. And <laughs> go on about my business. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. Well, let's see. I think that's the last of our questions. Greg, do you want to give us some closing remarks for the day as we put together this package? I have dropped your number in the chat. So definitely reach out to him, especially if you're in North Carolina, go ahead and get your documents together. We've shared um, one attorney's information in Georgia. So we are covering the United States. Hey. If y'all going down to North Carolina and you're leaving, you know, these high cost of living places, the Californians, the DCs, the New York, go ahead, go to North Carolina, get you a cheaper home. Um, <laughs> not, not that cheap and call Greg. Look, it's crazy. <laughs> So any closing remarks? Yeah, so, you know, Rosalind, I I'm so glad that we were able to connect on this very important topic, especially for uh, women, especially for uh, African-American women uh, who, in my mind, are, um, I mean, making amazing strides. Um, even my, my own household, my wife is, is doing amazing things in her career. And uh, while we're making these strides, we just want to make sure that we have uh, all of our documents in place. And uh, it, it's just one of those things where it's one less thing to th think about. It's being organized in that one additional area just to make sure that uh, the assets uh, pass to the next generation uh, the, the way that you want them to go. So yeah, Greg Davis, uh, Trusty Lawyers in Durham, North Carolina. My email is here. Rosalind, share my information. Uh, I really enjoyed my time with you all. Rosalind, uh, you were amazing. You, you made me laugh the whole way through. Thank you for making me feel so comfortable. And thank you for having me on tonight. All right, we got we got somebody gonna give you a call. You know, it's funny, somebody just said that they're gonna send their nephew child. I just had a conversation with my nephew too. You gotta push them. Like they, they don't be on their stuff sometimes. So if you see this <laughs> and you're like somebody else, somebody else need this message, make sure that you pass it along. Cause if you don't pass it along, they're going to be passing the plate at the funeral to <laughs> get a couple of dollars and they're going to say, but I know you got it. So we don't right. want that situation. We definitely want to make sure that the state plan documents are in place. So if you are not in North Carolina, but you know somebody who is, pass the information along, make sure that they have something in place. We talked about making sure that your parents have something in place, that they know where it is, that you know where it is. Um, if you're not the responsible person, you might not know where it is, but whatever that might be <laughs> and get you to that next step. I want to thank you so much, Greg, for joining us. I want to thank you for everybody who came in, viewed and engaged with us. And as usual, I want you to take these tools that you've gotten here tonight, use them as you come up with your plan to get towards financial independence. As always, I want to thank you. I want you to have a wonderful night and I can't wait to see you next Monday. Have a good one.